Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, welcome to uh, my last class this year at the Mises University. Unfortunately, I can't remain all week with you. I wish I could, but uh, tomorrow I'll be leaving after lunch. And so this is it for me. And uh, so I want to make this something really rousing and exciting, something to have you uh, up in arms. Not against me, I hope. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I want to talk this afternoon about what I call regime <clears throat> uncertainty. And this is an idea that uh, I didn't exactly invent. In fact, I believe the substance of this idea has been around for centuries. Uh, people have understood basically what I want this term to represent, but uh, it was never called this by this name. Uh, people did speak sometimes in uh, economics of regime uncertainty, but it was usually a term used uh, by financial economists or macroeconomists in a very specific way. And uh, the way I use it is quite different from the way finance people and macroeconomists use the term. Uh, when I use it, it, uh, it has reference to the security of private property rights. And that's why the regime here is literally the ruling regime, the political regime that uh, exercises governmental powers uh, over whatever territory and group of people we, we are considering. So regime uncertainty is uh, something that has a relation to government actions or inactions. Sometimes that'll cause uncertainty too. And uh, Regime uncertainty is a condition, that is a kind of pervasive, high degree of uncertainty, particularly among investors, entrepreneurs, and business people about the future security of their private property rights. Uh, it, it, it is something that appears especially during certain times. Uh, it could appear at any time, but it, in practice, we see it uh, most markedly appearing uh, in the wake of business contractions since 1929. We, we didn't really see uh, regime uncertainty uh, very much uh, before then, because before then, uh, governments did not react to business contractions by undertaking a variety of, of uh, measures to to fix the situation. There was, there, there was an episode in the, in the early 1890s in the United States that one might want to call regime uncertainty, but it was much more specific, had, had to do with people's confidence in the, in the durability of the gold standard. And of course that had to do with government because the gold standard was a monetary regime uh, operated by by the government, which basically fixed the price of gold and maintained it at the fixed rate against the dollar. Uh, but that was a much narrower uh, episode, even though it was important. Uh, we don't really see the, the, the kind of government activism we've grown used to uh, following a major business contraction until uh, the one that began in 1929. Previously, the dominant ideology had held that uh, there wasn't anything government could or should do about bad business developing. It, it, that was something that had happened from time to time for a century or more. Uh, when we look at the, say, the year 1900, we could look all the way back to the Depression of 1819, for example, that uh, Murray Rothbard wrote about in, in his dissertation. Uh, so there's nothing odd about business collapses. Uh, they've been around for a long time, but, but from 1819 all the way up to 1929, we have more than a century in which the dominant ideology, the one that constrained the actions of governments in power, was that there, there was nothing for them to do. 
This was just something that would sort itself out. Uh, and in fact, if they tried to do anything about it, uh, they would make it worse and cause its recovery to be retarded. And uh, an outstanding ex example of acting according to that ideology was uh, the actions of the Cleveland administration in the 1890s. Uh, the business collapse of 1893 uh, lasted quite a long time. There had never been a, a collapse that bad before or that long before. Uh, nonetheless, the Cleveland administration uh, against great political pressures to intervene in various ways to fix the, that situation did not do so. And if you look, look at what Cleveland administration officials said, they clearly understood that it just wasn't proper, right, or effective for them to get involved in that. And they didn't. Uh, they did maintain the gold standard, even though that cost them dearly politically. But nonetheless, they were acting in that way too, and completely in accordance with the long established ideology of limited government and respect for markets and private property. Well, those conditions began to change as a result of the progressive movement that, that changed many people's thinking in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, especially, first among opinion leaders and later among more and more members of the public. But uh, from 1929 on, the ideology had changed enough that we could always see governments in power reacting very vigorously in all sorts of ways when a major business contraction took place. And it's that, that frenzy of activism that brings about uncertainties with regard to the future of private property rights. I want to uh, talk about this concept with specific application to, to two periods when it has been very prominent and easy to identify, I think, and, and uh, consider the kinds of evidence that we can bring to bear to, to establish that it was in play and that it did have the kinds of effects that we would expect it to have a priori. And uh, these are the, uh, the periods of the Great Depression in the 1930s, and uh, the crisis that began, and uh, at least most visibly began in the fall of 2008, has certainly had in some ways begun earlier, but uh, uh, by the financial debacle of September 2008, it was quite obvious that something, something awful was happening, and uh, the government began to react with all sorts of wild uh, policy actions to, uh, to remedy the financial disturbances that took place, especially in September and October of 2008, and then thereafter for, for, for many years, right up to the present, in some ways the government has continued to follow up on these actions in some fashion. Now, we don't have time to, to, to conduct a complete course in the Great Depression and the recent uh, recession, this afternoon in this session, but we, we can just, uh, in an introductory fashion, take note of some of the, the high points of these episodes, as Austrians would expect. Both of them were preceded by, by periods of policy-induced uh, easy money. Credit became cheap, that is, cheaper than completely free markets would have made it uh, in both cases. and. Uh, Austrian economists have, have had a lot to say, uh, especially Rothbard, a lot to say about the, uh, the easy money of the 1920s and the role it played in leading up to the, the downturn in the middle of 1929. Uh, likewise, uh, lots of take of the easy money policies the Fed uh, imposed uh, from 2002, especially through 2005, and to some extent even afterwards and until uh, 2007 or so. But especially during those, those four years I've indicated there, the Fed was holding interest rates uh, substantially below free market levels and, and as a result, uh, producing effects that, uh, that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. Uh, 
when we had that kind of easy money regime, we always had uh, malinvestments. And uh, one characteristic form of those malinvestments, because artificially low interest rates have a bigger effect on longer term investments than on shorter term. And that's just arithmetic. That's not an Austrian idea. Uh, but because of that, uh, construction is always uh, a prime culprit in these business cycles produced by, by bad monetary policy because construction involves creating a very long-lived asset. And uh, so construction of new housing, new office buildings, new infrastructure uh, is very sensitive to the interest rate. So when you reduce the interest rate, you change the composition of investment and you shift it toward longer term investments relative to medium and short term investments. And you're getting malinvestment because you're creating a structure of capital that is not sustainable in the long term. Uh, in Austrian economics, we emphasize that capital is heterogeneous, uh, that it has a definite structure. It must be interrelated in certain ways in order to, to be viable in the long run or sustainable. Otherwise, we've got things that don't fit together. And some of those investment projects will turn out to be failures. And they will have to be abandoned. And when they're abandoned, there will be bankruptcies and, and unemployment and so forth. And then that will have cumulative effects. And we may have a full-fledged business contraction as a result. When we have these kinds of malinvestment booms, we always have uh, people who want to get rich off of them. So they always act as uh, magnets for financial wheeler dealers who, who invent new kinds of securities or new kinds of, of uh, financial market gimmicks. In the 20s, real estate bonds were all the rage and holding companies were created uh, in, in great numbers and Higher order holding companies were created, so they were companies that didn't hold any stock in a producing company, and, and they didn't hold any stock in a holding company. They held stock in a holding company that held stock in a holding company that held stock in a holding company. And, uh, and when, you, when you create uh, companies like that, you, you create the potential for enormous gains on your investment because you're essentially leveraging any profits at the lowest level, the level where goods and services are being produced, up through the higher levels by the fact that a, you don't have to own all the stock in a company to control it. So your own investment ends up yielding a very, very large return, but it works the same way in reverse, because if the fortunes of the foundation companies turn south and they, they start sustaining losses or lower profits than people expected, then, then the effect on holding companies up the line is magnified at each stage. And so in 1929, 1930, uh, nearly all these holding companies have been created in the previous decade actually went bankrupt. They, they went from being incredibly valuable to having no value whatsoever. Uh, so they just basically disappeared from the face of the financial earth. So we had that in the 20s. Uh, more recently, we had a lot of uh, derivative securities created with the foundation being mortgage securities, you know, from people's promises to repay mortgage loans that they had taken out. That was the source of the income flow, the cash flow. Uh, but then, of course, people created securities which amounted to packages of different kinds of mortgage loans. Uh, uh, of different risk classes, for example. And they figured out a way to get them classified as lower risk than they really were when they contained some higher risk elements in the package. So that eventually got leveraged up by, by derivatives that were derivatives of derivatives. You see what I'm driving at here. It's the same principle as the holding companies. If you had a higher order derivative security, you could get huge payoffs if things went your way and you could sustain enormous losses if they didn't. And to and sort of protect themselves against the potential for large losses, this new thing called a credit default swap was created and it was a way of avoiding insurance regulations. It was in effect a form of insurance that was not called insurance. Uh, there had been different kinds of financial swaps around for a long time, 
But these are basically new in the form they took after 2000. They were the main financial problem in the fall of 2008. They were the reason why the, <clears throat> the Fed and the Treasury felt it necessary to, to come to the rescue of AIG and, in effect, thereby to come to the rescue of, of investment banks such as Goldman Sachs and others. Now, when we did have the, for Austrians, inevitable bust that followed these episodes of easy money, what we see is uh, from mid-1929 on, the, the uh, real economy begins to contract. The stock market crashes in October. Uh, output falls eventually by the early part of 1933 by about 30%. Real output, real GDP, 30%. And that in, a, in the course of about four years or less. Uh, whereas in the recent crisis, uh, we have output falling from a peak early in 2008 uh, to a... Uh, a, a bottom in the middle of 2009, so this contraction was about six quarters long and amounted to about a 5% reduction in real GDP. There was a lot of talk around then as people were comparing the current events and the events of the Great Depression, and, and much of this was hyperbole. You know, if, you, if you think they were comparable in any important sense, you're wrong. They, 5% is not 30%, not even close. Now, something I'd like to show you here is an, is an important part of the business cycle that is not emphasized, it's not even noticed usually by mainstream economists. And what I've done here is I, uh, I've shown both uh, what economists usually look at, which is GDP, that's that solid line, uh, right here, and if you wanted to, you could put a growth trend in there, and I've done it by connecting the, the, the 1929 peak with the 1948 peak, and that's one way, if you're plotting the data in logarithms, that's one way of, uh, of, sh of showing the rate of growth that would have been uh, manifested by the economy if, if it had grown steadily between those two times rather than growing sometimes slower and sometimes faster. So we know it, can, it could have followed that path because, because it did. It ended up going from A to B, okay? but it didn't get there along that line. At any given year, if it had been on its steady growth path, it, it would have been somewhere on that line, uh, as you can see. In 1932, 34, uh, it's it's actually far below that growth trend. So there's a big gap between potential output and actual output at the depths of the depression. Uh, and then later on, there there is what looks like a, a period when actual output greatly exceeds potential output. And you might be shaking your head and saying, "How can that be? <laughs> How can you produce more than you're capable of producing?" And uh, there are some reasons why you might be able to do that for a while by capital consumption, but uh, the real reason for this big wartime bulge is mismeasurement of GDP. It's just a statistical artifact uh, for the most part. Uh, now, uh, on the bars down here in the lower part of the chart, I I've separated out the private part of GDP. Uh, and it, it, it behaves very differently during the war, and that was one reason I drew this chart in the first place. But in the 1930s also, you can see that, uh, that, that private uh, national product falls enormously, does recover some uh, by 1937, and many Keynesians particularly like to emphasize that recovery between 33 and 37. They say, ah, look, all was well after Roosevelt took office and put his policies into effect because 
the economy began to grow rapidly. Well, yes, it did. And even, pri even private output was growing fairly rapidly between 33 and 37. But look, in 37, the private economy is far below its growth trend. Okay? That's that dash line. But even in 37, it wasn't close to its potential output. There was still a big output gap there. And then, of course, the New Deal engineered this recession in a depression in 1938 and set recovery back another two years until finally in, in 1940, uh, the private economy made another gain. And, and in 41, it, it was uh, in some ways looking as if it had got back to where it was in 1929. But look, getting back to where you were in 1929 is not a recovery because you're still far below the potential you had to produce in 1941. So, you know, everything depends on the question you ask. And it's important when you think about macroeconomics or read about it, which you can do any given day in the newspapers, uh, you have to think about the implicit question that's being answered there when they tell you what's going on. Because very often they won't even be asking the right question. And if not, they'll be misleading you and everybody else. So this was a situation I wanted to emphasize about what was going on in the 1930s. Now, uh, another important thing that was part of this Great Depression was, was the fact that it wasn't just output uh, shown in bars here that collapsed, but especially the private investment. Private investment uh, collapsed between 19... Uh, oops, let's go back. Between uh, 1929 and 1932, uh, 33, uh, pri private investment fell by about 85 percent. That's gross private investment. Okay. Now, a large part of private investment that takes place in any year is made just to compensate for obsolescence and wear and tear of, of equipment. So you have to make a lot of investment just to keep your productive capacity where it is when you begin the year. And so much of gross investment amounts to capital consumption allowances, the amount of money that's estimated that must be spent in order to maintain productive capacity where you start. If you invest more than that, you're making net investment. And it's net investment that drives economic growth. Because if you only make enough investment to keep your capital stock fixed over time, you're never enlarging your capital, you're never uh, creating the capital you need to make labor more productive, both because they have more capital to work with and because when you make new investment, it gives you an opportunity to implement technological changes that require complementary capital in order to become useful. Now, there are two things that net investment do that are very important. Okay? Uh, so what was happening to net investment here? The answer is that it had become negative. In fact, it, it failed greatly in 1930, and, th and then it fell further and further and further. For the years 1931, 2, 3, 4, 5, every one of those years, net private investment was negative. That is to say, there was not enough gross investment being made to compensate for the capital consumption that was going on because of normal wear and tear and obsolescence. So if you have an economy with a, a diminishing capital stock, even if nothing else were happening to go wrong, you would certainly expect to have a, a more poorly performing economy in terms of the real output it produced. Yeah? In 1935 and 36, uh, net private investment became positive again, but not positive in large amounts. Uh, and, uh, excuse me, should, should have said 36 and 37 was positive again. Uh, and, and in fact, at that time, uh, and this relates to a story I'm going to tell in a few minutes about the Roosevelt administration, uh, Roosevelt and his 
lieutenants became quite confident that recovery was virtually complete. They said, oh, we got it made now. We're even getting private investors to come back and, and uh, make, make outlays to help us, help us get going forward. Okay? Uh, but uh, they were doing other actions at the same time that, that discouraged private investors and, and frightened them. And as a result, we had a collapse of private investment <coughs> In 1938, one of the largest in all American history, private investment fell in 1938 by about 35%. Look at that, in one year. So uh, it was a huge deal. And in that year, uh, real output fell by four or 5% too. So just the one year 1938 was comparable <laughs> to the recession we had more recently uh, in, in the magnitude of real output declines. Okay. Another way to see what was happening in investment is, is to look at the proportions investment uh, constituted in, uh, in, in GDP. And I've, I've shown that proportion here. If we start out in 1929, it's about 16% of GDP is gross private investment. And that's the white numbers. And then you see private investment falls, 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 uh, and then it, 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 it's a tiny bit more in 1933, and then it increases in 34, 35, 36, 37, and then there's that fall again I mentioned in 38, and it takes you another three years to get back to where you were in 1937. So there's a lot of running in place and running back and forth in the 1930s uh, uh, among private investors. Uh, every time they think they see some reason to go forward, uh, before long they see some reason to go backwards. So uh, when we look at the entire decade, in fact, in fact the 11 years, uh, 1930 through 1940 inclusive, and say how much investment was made by private investors in that entire period of 11 years, the answer is it adds up to a negative amount, negative. In other words, we went 11 years, we did not increase the U.S. capital stock at all. There was never a decade in U.S. history anything like that. Normally, that economy had been growing since the early 19th century, and in a normal decade, the private capital stock would grow 30 to 40 percent. So here, instead of having our normal 30 to 40 percent growth of capital in a decade, we have none or a little less than that. That's how bad the situation was, and that is the principal reason why full recovery never took place. The depression was not over in 1940. There was still an extraordinarily high rate of unemployment, for example. There were still several million people on the dole doing make work jobs created by the Roosevelt administration. Now, in both of these cases, as I've already suggested, the governments reacted with a frenetic collection of, uh, of uh, counter-cyclical actions, or at least actions that purported to be counter-cyclical. There's a big difference. Even if they sincerely believed that these things would help the economy recover or prevent it from falling any further, uh, almost everything they did exacerbated uh, the decline or retarded the recovery. And it wasn't just Roosevelt. Hoover got, got, got the country off to a terrible start by his reactions to uh, the, the, the onset of the Depression, particularly by the, the actions he took to get employers to not reduce wages. Wages had always been reduced at the onset of a recession in U.S. history. That was one way that employers kept their losses in check. And also, be, because reducing wages kept their, their losses from being too large, they were, they were not creating so many unemployed workers. They were not laying off so many people. They were keeping them on the payroll, just paying them less. And if you're a worker, Surely better to be still working for 80% of what you're making than not working and earning nothing at all. So this had 
characteristically been what happened, but Hoover develops some beliefs about the business cycle and how it should be dealt with that led him to think wage reductions were a bad idea. And so he used his influence to get a lot of big employers together in late 1929 and more or less twisted their arms to agree that they wouldn't reduce wage rates. Unfortunately, a lot of them gave into this pressure and did not reduce wage rates. And as a result, the rate of unemployment in the United States climbed much more quickly than it would otherwise have climbed. And that, of course, had secondary effects. Workers who weren't earning anything couldn't pay their own bills. And so they might cause merchants to go bankrupt and so forth down the line. There were cumulative effects. Uh, later on, uh, Hoover revived a World War I agency, the War Finance Corporation, and gave it a new name, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. It was exactly the same old organization. They even used the same firm forms when they started out. They crossed off on the form the word war and wrote in Reconstruction. That's how, how clearly we can see the, where this thing came from. And it, and it was even run by the same people. Good old Eugene Meyer, uh, who'd, who'd run the War Finance Corporation, came back to be one of the directors of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. In fact, if, if you've studied economic history of the 20s and 30s, you know Eugene Myers, he's everywhere. You know, he's like, he's like a multi-presence. Uh, he's there. He was one of Bernard Baruch's cronies, and Baruch is a similar guy. He's everywhere. You look around. He, he, either Baruch himself or one of his his kept senators uh, will be making a lot of economic decisions. So uh, we've got these important things taking place under Hoover, and then then when Roosevelt takes office, and the New Deal creates uh, right away a large number of highly significant economic intrusions in the economy then basically all, all hell breaks loose at that point because it, it, it's the same kinds of mistakes that Hoover and company were making, but on a much bigger scale, much more highly organized, much farther reaching. Uh, the worst of these things probably being the, uh, the creation of the National Industrial Recovery Act, a scheme to cartelize every industry in America by coercion, if you didn't write a, an agreement with your fellow producers in an industry, these, these are called codes of fair competition, of course, because their real purpose was to suppress competition. And you should remember Higgs' first law of statutory naming, which states that whatever a statute is called represents the exact opposite of what it actually does. Okay? So a code of fair competition was actually a code to suppress competition. And if you didn't write one for yourself with your fellow co-conspirators with government approval, then the government would simply write one for you and impose it on you. They had something called the blanket code that they would insist people have. And, and so, of course, more than 700 uh, groups of businessmen got together and wrote these these things up, and it was an absolute disaster. Okay? The whole idea being to reduce output, so you know industry X can get a higher price. But think it through: if every industry in America reduces output, isn't that what we mean by a recession? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So this was supposed to be an anti-recession measure, which just on the face of it was absurd. And the remarkable thing, you see Adam Smith said there's a lot of ruin in the nation. The remarkable thing is in spite of NIRA, there was a little bit of recovery in 1930, 34 and 35. Not much. And in fact, some of it was spurious because some of it was just industry's attempt in the summer and fall of 1933 to produce inventories before they had to pay higher labor costs as part of the NIRA agreement. <laughs> so that misled a lot of economists to this day. 
Keynesians think, oh, look, there's an immediate spurt of output. And they don't bother to see what output because they never ask what output. GDP is all they ever look at. Aggregate output, that's all they care about. See, but if you're, if you're doing economics to that level, you're not really doing economics. Well, um, there was a little recovery in spite of NIRA, but not very much. Similarly, agriculture was cartelized and controlled and subsidized and taxed and uh, pulled this way and that way uh, at the behest of agricultural interest groups, agricultural equipment manufacturers, and so forth. Now, uh, similarly, after the financial debacle of 2008, uh, we had all kinds of attempts to bail out uh, firms, big firms especially, of course, they always have the political clout. Uh, we had the Fed decide it was gonna provide liquidity for one and all, basically. Well, that's not true, not one and all. There were some who didn't have the influence and the clout, so they didn't get any special help. But a lot of people did on an extremely large scale, uh, pe pe people like those in the in the commercial paper uh, financial industry. Commercial paper short-term loans that businesses make to, to carry inventories until they're sold and to pay the next payroll, things like that. Well, you know, that's just part of the kind of day-to-day -day operation of businesses to borrow uh, with commercial paper securities. Well, that, that, that market displayed rising rates of interest in late 2008. Uh, to which I said, so what? Okay. There are reasons why interest rates should be rising on commercial paper in the conditions of late 2008. That says it ought to be. Okay. But that seemed to scare the devil out of the Fed, and they rushed in to pour uh, billions and billions of dollars in, into the commercial paper market to see that these dealers didn't go broke. Well, they were going to go broke anyhow. Prices don't just cause people to go broke because they go up, uh, especially if you're just a dealer. You're a middleman, for Christ's sake. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that was one of the things the Fed did, and it did a whole host of other things to, to bail out big firms, big banks, and the TARP program, which was created to, to relieve firms that found themselves loaded down with, uh, with toxic derivatives. Uh, you know, these mortgage-based uh, securities that turned out to be worth a lot less than people had thought they were because their risks had been understated and misunderstood when they were created. Uh, the, the situation was not that these things had become worthless. Most of them still had considerable value, but in the circumstances late in 2008, it was hard to say how much they were worth. So the market sort of dried up for these things. And in a sense, they were worthless because it was hard to sell a lot of them quickly. Okay? And people worried that if they kept holding on to these, they would end up with essentially worthless securities. They didn't like that, especially if they were big boys. So they got their pals in the Fed and the Treasury to come riding in and rescue them with the TARP program. But that didn't work, see, because the guys at the Treasury weren't any smarter what do you know? They weren't any smarter than the guys in the private financial markets at figuring out what these, what these toxic securities really were worth. So they went out to pay the holders for these securities and take them off their hands, but they, they couldn't figure out how much to pay them. And so after a few weeks, they just threw up their hands and they said, we give up. What, let's say we just give you the money instead. Uh, <laughs> So that's what they did. They, 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 they bought preferred shares in about 700 banks. That is, they, they became investors. They became part owners of all these private banking companies. Now, interesting to an economic historian is that exactly this same thing is what was done after the Nas National uh, after the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was created in 1932. What did they do mostly? They bought preferred shares in banks, insurance companies, railroads, farm co-ops, and so forth to give money to these guys who were, who were in economic difficulty, okay? So 
we got all this hell breaking loose and a lot of crap not thinking that I don't have time to wade through here. Uh, but <clears throat> the upshot of all this uh, bad action and bad thinking is that uh, people don't really know what's to expect anymore. They don't know what to expect anymore. And especially after 1935, because then Roosevelt decided it was not politically expedient for him to be pals anymore with business interests. In the beginning, when they created NIRA in 1933, he was trying to, trying to respond like a normal politician to all the powerful interest groups. And certainly business interest groups were powerful. Uh, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Chamber of Commerce, those big interest lobbies, uh, they, were all, they were all hot for NIRA, of course. They'd been trying to get something like that for years, uh, which, by the way, also goes back to World War I, when the War Industries Board had run a prototype of this kind of scheme. But in 19... 34, 35, Roosevelt had kind of decided that, well, recovery's coming along. I don't need these business lobbies on my side anymore. And besides, all these crackpots like Huey Long and, and Dr. Townsend are, are real political threats to me in the election of 1936. So I need to cut them off at the knees. And the way I'll do it is I'll get as radical as they are. I'll mount class warfare. I'll start blaming everything on businessmen, investors, bankers. And of course, that's easy because 99% of us don't belong to those classes, right? <laughs> so that looks like a good deal politically. We'll get the massive voters saying, yeah, hang those guys from the nearest oak tree. So that was basically Roosevelt's rhetoric in 1935, 36, 37. And what do you know? Uh, this had never happened before. In the whole history of the United States, no president ever gone on the war path against businessmen. This is supposed to be a country run by businessmen. And in large part, it was up until 1935. But now the president himself and his chief aides have turned on business, particularly big, rich investors. So they start going after them with regulation, with new taxes, with just threats to take over their property, and it, it scares the devil out of these guys. It scares them. Let me tell you, just as an example, so you won't think I'm making everything up. Uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm reading from a, a paper I wrote called Regime Uncertainty. You can, you can Google this and get a copy of it uh, in one or two clicks. In, uh, in 1937, Lamont DuPont, who was one of the rich private investors in the country, who wrote in a letter, a private letter, this was not a piece of propaganda. He wrote, uncertainty rules the tax situation, the labor situation, the monetary situation, and practically every legal condition under which industry must operate. Are taxes to go higher, lower, or stay where they are? We don't know. Is labor to be union or non-union? Are we to have inflation or deflation? More government spending or less? Are new restrictions to be placed on capital? New limits on profits? It is impossible to even guess at the answers. Okay, this is the difference between risk and uncertainty. <laughs> When it is impossible to even guess at the answers, that's uncertainty. Okay? They didn't know what was coming up. They kept trying to clarify the situation, but they did not succeed until long afterwards when it clarified itself, more or less. Now, we're running out of time, but uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, because this has begun to be discussed quite a lot, uh, finally, first by by people in the press and, and by lay people, people like those of us in this room, uh, and even in recent years by professional economists, they finally got a clue about this. Uh, sometimes pe pe people look at what guys like, like Bob Higgs write, and they think, oh, he's just a crackpot, okay? But there's some evidence behind this, and there are different kinds of evidence. One is, 
that we know what was going on. If we're any good at history, we can tell you about a lot of things happening in the 1930s or since 2008 that describe turmoil, that describe irregularities, that describe instabilities that make life hard to forecast, okay? So there's some history we can, we can tell here. Second, there's a lot of direct testimony by investors and business people themselves, like Lamont DuPont, who tell us, you know, we don't know what's going on, what's next. There's a lot of poll data that are relevant. Economists usually laugh this out of court, but there's no reason why they should. It's certainly as good as this national income and product accounts that they regard as gospel. Okay. Uh, and then I think per perhaps the most decisive evidence of all comes from the yield curves on corporate securities. That's hard. That's put your money where your mouth is stuff. You can't laugh that away. And if, if you're seeing an increase in regime uncertainty, what you ought to expect is an extraordinary steepening of the yield curve. That is, you should see a disproportionate rise in the effective yields on longer-term securities. Because, you know, it's not that tough to form expectations about next year, but two years, five years, 10, 20, in a situation of regime uncertainty, that becomes very difficult. And therefore, if you're going to buy a security promising to pay you 20 years from now, you're probably going to discount the price you pay pretty, pretty heavily and therefore... Uh, raise the effective yield on that security. And that's exactly what happened. It happened both uh, after 1934 and diminished in 1942, which exactly fits the second New Deal. What do you know? And it happened after 2008 as well. I, I ran through the same kinds of evidence for the post-financial debacle. The, the events of more recent years are not as drastic as the ones of the 1930s, and that's as I would expect, because we don't have the same situation now that we had then. Uh, there's also been the creation of some policy uncertainty indexes, the most uh, discussed being the one by Baker, Bloom, and Davis, and what you can see here is if you follow this thing, uh, the events since the financial debacle here pushed that index up to extraordinarily high levels compared to where it was in the in the previous 20 years or more. So that's consistent. Also, I have many problems with these indexes, by the way. I don't have time to go into that right here, but uh, they, are, they are problematic. Uh, in the 1930s, the system itself was up for grabs. As DuPont said, are we gonna have capitalism or socialism or what? Well, that question was answered long ago. We're going to have fascism. Okay, So that's not an issue anymore. So now when we have regime uncertainty, uh, it's not about the nature of the system. Uh, it's not, the system is locked in now, but, but we have major policy details up for grabs. Things like who's going to be bailed out? What's the TARP program going to do? How's the Fed going to allocate credit? Because it doesn't just use open market policy anymore. It allocates credit to specific sectors and specific forms of investment, okay? And then we have these giant instruments like Obamacare and uh, the Dodd-Frank Act, which opened the door to hundreds of new kinds of regulation. And we don't know how they're gonna be fixed. They gotta get the regulars working out there, which means we've got hundreds of new political processes tied to every one of those proceedings as people try to get their pound of flesh out of whatever the right regulations say. Uh, and that has created so much uncertainty that just these things, not to mention a bunch of others that I might mention, are enough to help us understand why private investment has been very slow to recover since 2009, uh, and still is not on a net basis back to where it was before the recession. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>